This is Joshua Toomey of the Talk To Me podcast, and you are listening to Discography Discussion. You're listening to Discography Discussion, episode 159, Pantera, with Joshua Toomey of Talk To Me Podcast. Do you have them in fat guy sizes? <laughs> I got like two fat guy sizes, and they were like the first two to go. Oh, man. Hosted by Dan Terry. Oh, shit. Yeah, you're right. Well, I did say that. And Joseph Wren. I'm trying to say I don't take myself seriously all the time. Presented by DiscussMetal.com. And if yesterday don't mean shit unless you said bad things about Pantera, then you are ready for this episode of Discography Discussion. I am Joe. That is Dan. Joshua Toomey is here from Talk Toomey. I am here. It's about time we did this episode. (laughs) Yeah, it is about damn time. Well, first of all, let me say one thing. Two years ago, if you're not aware, roughly two years ago, we did something uh, Pantera related that we thought would be really funny. Thought it was really funny at the time. But looking back on it, I don't know if the joke is still funny two years later. So it's one of those deals where uh, we just thought that maybe, you know, there were some people out there that felt like we didn't give Pantera the credit that they deserved. I mean, personal opinion aside, you're still dealing with a band that is considered a metal legend by a really a good majority of the people that listen to metal. So it is one of those situations where, you know, is that the episode that Pantera really deserves? I I don't think so. And, uh, you know, I have had some conversations with some people uh, that have been associated with the Pantera camp since that happened. And uh, I have gained kind of a kind of a different perspective on things. And um, so we're we're, we're going to we're going to try to cut the comedy bullshit a little bit. Um, and 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 really just talk about these albums, the, these landmark albums that that affected so many people. We're not going to talk about the power metal albums from the '80s too. Uh, <laughs> you could talk about those. <laughs> uh, I'm still not entirely sold on uh, on you know your your projects in the jungle and <laughs> and things of that nature. Look, dude, power metal is probably Anselmo's best singing vocals, but he made a complete turn. And had a completely different style after Cowboys from Hell. I disagree, but we will get into it. Well, before we get into this Pantera thing with Josh Toomey, I want to take this time to say thank you to everyone for listening to the podcast. Thank you for listening and for subscribing. If you are not a subscriber, then you can find everything Discography Discussion at DiscussMetal.com. We're on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts. Tune in radio, Stitcher, so if you have an Amazon Echo or a Google Home, you have no excuse. Ask it to play the latest episode of the Discography Discussion podcast, and it will. We're also on Facebook and on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Be sure to like, favorite, and subscribe. It really helps us out. It lets us know you're listening, and now Dan is going to tell us all about five-star reviews. Well, we do love five-star reviews here on Discography Discussion, but one thing that I like more than reviews is I like shares, I like comments. I like talking to you guys. So, you know, when an episode comes out and you have strong feelings for it, uh, let us know, good or bad. Uh, I I love the interaction. I love talking to you guys. I love the email. So just keep them coming. It's been a fun community. And now Toomey's going to tell us all about Talk To Me Podcast. I did not know there was going to be homework. Let's see here. The Talk To Me Podcast hosted by myself, Joshua Toomey, available on all podcast platforms such as Spotify, iHeartRadio, and, uh, you know, Podcast Addict, Apple Podcasts, all that great stuff. And uh, basically just an interview uh, show, latest uh, episodes with, uh, who have we had on recently? Mike uh, Michael Lalago, famous uh, A&R guy that signed Metallica to Electra Records. That was a good uh, one. Andreas Kisser of Sepultura. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Gene Hoagland of Testament. And then there was the grade where I got to go to San Francisco and actually sat down with Phil Dimmel, formerly of Machine Head, now uh, back with violence. Uh, That was a fun episode to do, too. So, yeah, go check it out. We got an email from a listener in regards to our Mushroom Head episode. And uh, more specifically, it was in reference to the album title The Righteous and the Butterfly, 
Whereas if you guys listen to the episode, you may know that I said that that album title had no meaning at all. Well, I was corrected. And apparently the references of The Righteous and The Butterfly would be J.J. Righteous and The Butterfly is Skinny's wife who passed away. And because I now know that, I feel kind of bad about what I said because I really, you know, at the time did not have that information and I don't know how widely available it was. That being said, I did not mean to be insensitive on that. And I just want to issue that as a correction that, you know, this album title did have a meaning and I really appreciate you bringing it to my attention. So, Josh. Yes, sir. Tell me about Pantera. <laughs> Do you mean the greatest heavy metal band from the state of Texas to come and grace our ears? Pantera? They were a, a force to be reckoned with and uh, one of my all-time favorite bands. That's what you get. Absolutely. One of the most influential metal guitarists of all time with Dimebag. There is more than one... Dimebag Daryl trick in every modern lead guitarist, myself included. The riffs, the perfect balance. Did you just put yourself in the category with Dimebag Daryl? No, I merely said that I was influenced by Dimebag. So is like every kid that plays a guitar in a basement. Fuck yeah. You have to have that perfect level of blues, sludge, southern rock, and that attitude that was very specific to Pantera. Individually, as a guitarist, he was just a louder Eddie Van Halen, but that's what he wanted to be, and he got a ton of credit. I don't know if I agree with that 100%. I mean, I think maybe his origins had a had a, had a um, loud Eddie Van Halen sound to it, but I mean, you never heard Eddie Van Halen play anything like Suicide Note Part 2. I mean, come on, man. <laughs> like that's 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 insanity and i know like i'm the i'm the guy but like it's still one of those like you know it, you can't make a statement like that and it really like an influence is not the same as a ripoff and i think a lot of people have a lot of trouble nobody said ripoff i want to be clear about that <laughs> well no i mean you you literally just said that dimebag was a loud eddie van halen which i know like i said that once but i was just being a dick <laughs> um <laughs> No, I, I think that I think what's interesting about Pantera is I, I don't necessarily want to highlight one member over the other as much as I think it is a combination of perfect ingredients, uh, kind of like the perfect storm, so to speak. Because, I mean, you've got Dimebag, who is an incredible guitarist, who has a tone that nobody else has and a volume that nobody else has. But then you also have Rex, who is basically like I mean, and it's hard to, it's hard to really quantify this on the albums. Like Rex sounds amazing on the albums, but like when you watch live videos, like I spent the entire week watching Pantera live videos. And so like when when Dime goes off on a solo and you've got Rex backing him up, like the band loses no intensity. And like you guys know what I'm talking about, right? Like where where the guitarist will go off on a solo and it just it almost kind of seems like everything stops. But like when you're watching Pantera live, if you if you were lucky enough to have a chance to see that, you would see that the intensity never goes down, and that's a combination of not not only Rex Brown but also Vinnie Paul, who again is keeping the intensity up at a level that I think a lot of bands are almost like incapable of doing whenever they only have one guitar player on stage. And then you've got Phil and Selmo, who is the most one of the most animated insane front men <laughs> out there whether you want to consider that a good or a bad thing i think for me it depends on what day it is but this band is able to keep the hype going from beginning to end well that's the thing with the songs is i saw phil over the summer opening for slayer doing an entire pantera set and actually i guess i saw him uh louder than life here too both times doing an entire pantera set and even though it was good it still wasn't Pantera because you needed the four ingredients to make the uh, to make the Pantera stew, I guess. Okay. To make those those four guys <laughs> were Pantera, and you need that to to continue on. And with all the talk of of reunions and tributes, and you know, get Phil and Rex back on stage with Chris Adler and and Zach Wild or something, that would be fun to watch. But it still would never be Pantera in its essence. And the one thing that we were talking about with Dimebag was 
there, there was never an he never played a note that I didn't believe because I you know you watch him play and he he means every single note he ever played no matter what so I think that's yes he was influenced by Eddie Van Halen but also like it was just in him to play guitar and then on Rex there's so there's so much when you're listening to those albums and if you just focus on what Rex is doing Rex is holding his own there so I mean you've got Dimebag but you've got Rex keeping the songs going even though he's not just playing the main riff under under the guitar solo like he's almost playing a, a bass solo along with the guitar solo and then you know Vinny's drums are just massive and some of the uh, almost genre breaking drum sounds and things like that so amazing drummer and then Phil you know one of my favorite frontmen of all times and a lot of it has to do with the not only the animation of him of him but just the the nonsense that he would spew on stage about, like, you know, it was like smoke acid and drop weed and, you know, all the philisms <laughs> that you would see live, you know, watching videos where he's just incoherent and, uh, you know, obviously very much drug uh, induced. But it was still, uh, you know, in the 90s when we would go see him live. I mean, those were like that was like Phil being Phil. And it was it was amazing. Yeah, I just watched a video today on my lunch break. And at the end of it, Phil just runs up to the mic and yells, smoke heroin. Just like there you go. Yeah. throws himself on the floor. I was just like, "What the hell did I just watch?" It was so funny. And the one thing with Phil and all that too was was that's a whole lot of Mike Muir. That's a whole lot of Henry Rollins. You know, that he he wears his influences on his sleeves too. So you know, he kind of emulated all those guys. So where do we want to start with this, guys? Do do Joe? Do you do you really want to go all the way back to the first albums? I think you can lump those first ones in together and just be like, hey, you know, this is what happened, but then start with uh, Cowboys. Well, let's talk about where Pantera was and when they decided to become what they are known for. Good luck to the listener to find Metal Magic, Projects in the Jungle, I Am the Night, or Power Metal, because I can only find them on vinyl online for way too much money (laughs) (laughs) i've listened to them and i'll be honest there's a lot of real basic 1980s power metal that sounds great if pantera was only a power metal band and never did any of the 90s and early 2000s definitive albums they'd just be another name in the large stack of here's all the hair metal bands that did kind of the same thing. But then they got a new vocalist, Phil Anselmo, and they put out 1988's Power Metal. If you can find this, you need to listen to it because the vocals that were there on Cowboys from Hell, the high-pitched, I really want to be Rob Halford that never really came back, They are in full force on this album. And that's honestly the only one I have to share from the 80s. Like I said, good luck finding the old ones. I can't find them. I'm sure they're on YouTube somewhere in terrible quality. But (laughs) can we really talk about it honestly if we can't put it on the player and sit down and actually listen to it? Well, I'll say this, because I did skim through these albums on YouTube. Quality be damned. And one thing that I noticed is that you know they, they start off as... Kind of your kind of your your stereotypical uh, glam band, you know. Um, co- Metal songs, magic projects so, in the yeah. jungle. <laughs> so, songs are not songs are not that complicated. Um, y- you've got you've got great solo work, but you know this is when not Dimebag Daryl, but Diamond Daryl uh, was <laughs> yeah, playing uh, Rex Rocker. <laughs> right, Rex. Yeah, yeah. The the infamous Rex Rocker. Uh, they, you you know, I mean, he had some good solos. You know, like decent. Nothing compared to what he was going to do. But, you know, th- these records were just like, hey, these are the bands that we like. And we, we want to sound like the bands that we like. And I-, I think what is interesting about even this incarnation of Pantera is they just never seemed to be completely satisfied with where they were at. They were always kind of trying to push a little bit harder, a little bit further. And so what's interesting even about these old albums is they do progressively get heavier Whereas you know you you get to power metal and you know you've got you've got new vocalist Phil Anselmo you've got but you've got like kind of a thrashier sound like you can tell like they're listening to less you know Kiss and more Megadeth and and Metallica 
and they're they're trying to go heavier. They're trying to push where they're at. But like even if you listen to Phil's vocals on on power metal, they're they're like Rob Halford esque, but they've got a little bit of that harder edge to them. Where um, th- there's this weird period in in early heavy metal where the vocalists like Rob Halford, like I said, uh, like th- they're so high pitched, but they're also kind of growly and snarly. <laughs> And so with uh, power metal, you end up with a really weird mix of are these vocals supposed to be extreme or are they supposed to be like super, super melodic? And I don't think that Phil really was that on this record, but it is interesting to see that the band was going in a heavier direction before this. But I it, it, this is something that I say a lot on this podcast, but like I don't really think that anybody was ready for the change from power metal to cowboys from hell. I mean, like, there's nothing on power metal that is going to even hint at what cowboys from hell was. And I think that a lot of that change came from Phil's one of Phil's favorite bands in New Orleans at the time was Exhorter. And if you listen to that Exhorter album, Slaughter in the Vatican, and you hear it now, you're like, oh shit, that's exactly where they figured out to go in that cowboys from hell vein because the early Exhorter stuff sounds like early pantera right and so and you can clearly see that that pantera was kind of a glam band and then you know it's almost like phil walks in like in a back to the future and he's like you know that new sound you're looking for <laughs> but listen to this you know and then he plays that and they, they go oh shit we should be a little bit heavier and i know that the the the, the uh what is it the 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 statement that they say happened was they're like one day they went off stage and they're like, you know what? These clothes don't play the music. We play the music. So we're just going to go up there as ourselves and we're going to be ourselves and stuff. But I mean, I've had um, Marzi Montezari on the podcast who is now in Exhorter, but he was in that whole Houston, Dallas, you know, New Orleans scene. And, you know, he basically said that whole story. He was like, no, they, they, they heard Exhorter. They loved Exhorter. And they were like, wait a minute, we should do something like that. And then they became... Cowboys from Hell, Pantera. Yeah, there's always so much controversy, too, because, you know, when you get these type of fandoms involved, you know, a- assholes are going to be like, well, they just ripped their sound off of such and such. I-, I don't really think that it's it's that. I mean, obviously, they had probably heard Exhorter, who did sound like this prior to Pantera. Uh, but, you know, I think that I think that Pantera, because, like, listening to both of the bands side by side, I think that there are cosmetic similarities. You know, it's like if... Uh, yeah, you know, it's like it's like if me and Joe hear Primer Fifty Five and we decide that we're gonna play in a band similar to Primer Fifty Five, uh, you know, like odds are we're probably not gonna just like straight up copy. So I think, I think Pantera had had a spe- had special ingredients that maybe Exhorter didn't have. And I don't, I mean, I like Exhorter, but I'm just saying, like, I don't think that they were as similar as the quote unquote controversy would lead you to believe. Well, I think the the problem is with that is the fact that you have those first four Pantera albums and then a huge switch. Like if you'd have never heard Pantera and you just had two brand new bands, Pantera and Exhorter, you're like, oh well, it's just uh, what is it? What is it? Shared thought or collective whatever. Collective thinking, you, yeah. Yeah, collective thinking, all that. So it's just like you know that was just a a mix of what was going on at the time. You know, everybody was listening to Slayer and Master of Puppets and all this stuff, and that's what comes out is is that exhorter sound but what always goes against pantera in this argument is you have a a decade's worth of albums before uh you know cowboys from hell to kind of go oh shit and i didn't actually hear exhorter until much later into my fandom of pantera so you're like ugh, like wow i guess maybe they do have a point that uh (laughs) that that they you know i'm never gonna say stole but you know you can be influenced and be like hey we should do some stuff like this not necessarily let's do this. Well, what record were they trying to make in 1983? They were basically trying to make a Kiss album. Yeah. Because it's your first record, guys. It's the Daryl Brothers. You've got that brotherly kinship and love of music, so they're going to work together and have some of the same ideas because they grew up like me and Dan, where Dan says it needs to be heavier. It needs to be like this. And then I have to go figure out how to make it sound like that. So it's that combination plus... We want to play in a band. We want to play music. If you do that for 10 years and one day you wake up, you put out Power Metal, which is arguably the best of the Power Metal albums by Pantera, your instinct is not to change the band name 
and create the Cowboys from Hell attitude and change your whole style. It was 1990. Everybody changed their attitude. Everybody had a different way of looking at music. Everybody picks on grunge for destroying the rock show. But here was Pantera just yeah. playing a fucking show, being loud as hell, wearing their influences on their sleeve. And you've got Phil who does what he does and creates 1990 Cowboys from Hell. To me, I don't know if you need to do your intro, but your music's running. <laughs> What's interesting about Cowboys from Hell is that there still are elements of power metal in here. Because I think oh, absolutely. I think Cowboys from Hell kind of out of the more well known Pantera albums has a distinctly different sound than what you'd get on Vulgar Display and Fuck Far Beyond Driven. Power, yes. Yeah, like okay, Joe, we're gonna get to that album. I know. <laughs> but uh <laughs> you know, I, like what I like about Cowboys is that it, it is like the perfect blend of traditional heavy metal with that nineties fuck you attitude like of we're just going to be super heavy we're going to be aggressive phil shows off his aggressive style of singing in certain songs but on others he still adopts kind of a a singy more of a sing song sound and what i like about this record is like i'm having a conversation with my dad at one point where he's like you know i remember heavy metal bands when they came out like iron maiden and you know like def leppard and bands like that He's like, but then you tell me that you listen to metal and I come in your room and all it is is like blast beats and screaming. He's like, where's the transition? And honestly, Cowboys from Hell is literally that perfect transition. It's the missing link between these like more extreme forms of metal that are popular now versus kind of the more old school, like deeply rooted metal stuff. The stuff that had a little bit more blues influence. And obviously the addition of groove into... uh, pantera sound really um that that groove really gives it that texas sound it, it like it it sounds gritty it sounds dirty but it still has all the elements you like from heavy metal this is actually such an important album because it bridges the gap from old school metal heads to newer metal fans not not new metal but newer metal <laughs> well i think the one thing with, with cowboys from hell is obviously growing up as a kid having this on cassette this was a side a side b record where the first where side a was like the new stuff and then you almost had like a a, a side b of filler that i may or may not have listened to as much and maybe even got into a little bit more later on in life but i mean songs like medicine man and message in blood and stuff like that towards the end of the record are are more rooted in their 80s sound to where you you know you got like domination and primal concrete sledge and 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 the the heavier stuff towards the the uh beginning of the record so you could almost see that that you know if you're talking about a a transition record from one thing to another you know that you have it all in one record because you've got all of the early you know phil's high-pitched voice and high-pitched screaming on on the medicine man and stuff like that and then you've got the heavier you know cowboys from hell and primal concrete sledge and heresy and all that stuff so it it is definitely a a transition record and it's almost like two separate bands on this album yeah, definitely. It sounds like like a uh, older metal band at war with a with a newer metal band, <laughs> right. and, um, which is great. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> well, it's weird too because so like there's a few things that that stood out to me the last time I listened to this, which was uh, earlier this week, uh, just kind of prepping up for the episode. Is um, certain songs stood out to me more than they did before, like uh, the sleep. For whatever reason, like as much of a meathead as I am, I loved that song, even though I remember a friend of mine in high school. Was like, yeah, man. If you listen to this record, skip track eleven. It's called "The Sleep," and it will put you to sleep. And uh, <laughs> I was like, okay, whatever. But I, I listened to it uh, this week, and I was like, wow, that's really good. And then to follow it with the art of shredding, I think was really one of the best ways to end this record. Uh, but it's kind of fun too, because like, yeah, it sounds like two bands at war with each other, but at the same time, it also sounds like a greatest hits album for a band you've never heard. Like when you're listening to it, it because you know how typically with the greatest hits record they will start with the newest stuff at, at the top and then slowly go backwards. Uh, I felt like that's what this album kind of sounds like. If you're if you don't know Pantera, you know you you might be fooled into thinking that this record is a compilation of previous material that you just haven't heard. It definitely plays that way. It sounds like the songs that the Daryl Brothers were working on together 
when nobody else was around, and it's the 80s, so, man, nobody's going to like this. What are we going to call it? Call it Primal Concrete Sledge. That's hilarious. Ha, ha, ha. And then 1990 comes around. You get those influences. Everything just turns slightly to the left, and it's, guys, this is awesome. You got anything else? Do we? <laughs> and this stuff, you know, you're watching the the live shows from that time. You know, you've got the great Foundations Forum uh concert there where a lot of the live footage was taken from the from those early videos and just the club shows of that time with the band and you know phil once again just you know stage diving and jumping all over the crowd and and you know stomping all over the over the uh, stage and just a just a huge huge uh presence on stage and actually uh, rob rivera a friend of your show and my show uh talks about the only time he ever saw pantera was on this tour opening for like sacred reich or something like just just the opening opening band and he said he'd never seen 30 minutes of like someone just walk on stage slay for 30 minutes and walk off stage and just completely destroy an entire room and then the, uh, the other show obviously the the other huge show of this tour was the uh, moscow you know half a million people was was right before they started recording or during the recording process of vulgar so you've got that too where they you know they go over to moscow opening for metallica ACDC and the Black Crows and play all they got was five songs that day and that's all they needed man well and something interesting that we were talking about you know on the last Pantera episode uh, if you want to call it that is I, I was I don't know going on about some kind of bullshit I don't know I was drunk uh, about like oh there's so many bands that are heavier than Pantera and you mentioned that you know well there wasn't any band heavier than Pantera at that time in the commercial vein and uh, it took a, it took a little while for that to sink in, but but to be honest, like you're you're right. Like when, when you're looking at 1990, like that that was an era where you know the glam bands from the late 80s were still touring. You know, this is like when the business kind of started to decline, but not everybody was necessarily aware of it. You know, but like it was mm -hmm. starting starting to go downhill, and so for Pantera to come out with a record like this, that you know has a variety of influence like if you're into metal you're still gonna love cowboys from hell but if you're into hardcore you might also dig cowboys from hell not as much as you're gonna dig uh vulgar display of power <laughs> but you know like like people that were into kind of more like i feel like in a certain sense like um dimebag created kind of this uh, or he was called diamond daryl at the time um created kind of this uh like he almost catered to the old school metal fans Whereas then you have like um, you have like Vinny's drumming that's like super heavy, right? And then you've got Phil who is going for a more aggressive vocal style. So it's like they appealed to two crowds really well in a perfect way for that year. And I think that is largely the reason for the for the album's success was that um, you're you're appealing to heavy music in general in a way that I don't think any other band had really at that time. I mean, Metallica, I mean, would come with the Black Album, you know. <laughs> but, like, that's not nearly as heavy as Cowboys from Hell, <laughs> you know. Um, so, like, and, and, you know, Megadeth, whatever. The, I don't even remember what Megadeth was doing that year. But um, all of these... All 90 these, would have been a Seasons of the Abyss by Slayer. That's about... Yeah, and, and you know... Commercially, that's what you got. Yeah, and on our, in, on our Slayer episode, we were like, uh eh. Well, that's the whole thing, too. Like, Slayer, obviously super extreme, right? But their record sounded really thin. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, you could, it had that, like, thin, thrashy, trebly sound. Whereas, uh, you know, Cowboys from Hell was, like, thick and sludgy. And it was it was different than what we were used to. And it's arguably year. the thinnest of the 90s albums. I say we. I was four years old. I mean, what the fuck? <laughs> but, <laughs> I want to be in the room when they were laying this down because there are some production decisions that don't make sense no matter how I look at it. It sounds like an 80s album where they mixed the guitars the way Dime wanted them to sound and turned them up. But it also sounds like a 90s record where we cranked the mids a little bit and could actually hear where the guitars were playing. So there are some production decisions that were made and I can't tell you why they were made, but the secret sauce of 1990 created this monster of a metal sound that Pantera still gets credit for. Oh, absolutely. And that had a lot to do with uh, Terry Date, you know, uh, coming in and that was some yeah. of the that was, 
That was some of his early, you know, producing credits too. Was were, were the uh, Pantera records? Definitely. Well, we have got to keep this train rolling if we're gonna get done before you know ten o'clock. <laughs> Is it time for this thing? That yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Let's let's get to the album that everybody wants us to talk about, which is a uh, vulgar display of power. We're gonna jump to the Great Southern Trend Kill. Nineteen ninety two, <laughs> you motherfucker. <laughs> I'm gonna be here listening to Walk for the next five minutes. You guys go ahead. Does Walk even five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> kind of the simplest song on the record with the extra shit at the end yeah absolutely fair enough uh okay so vulgar display of power um it's fucking great (laughs) it is it has the best fucking riffs it has the best fucking groove i love it okay now that we've got all of our fanboy comments out of the way uh so vulgar display of power you know we said earlier that cowboys from hell sounded like two bands at war with each other this is the heavy one this record is is <laughs> like okay, the sludgy hardcore style band one, and and that that's what the next record is. You know, like they 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 edged out the traditional metal, but at the same time, you know, Phil's vocals obviously much more hardcore influenced, um, screaming heavy. Um, he does some pterodactyl screams, <laughs> which are fantastic, <laughs> and uh, I, I love a good pterodactyl scream. But uh, you know, it, it, this was like we we made a we made a decision. Whereas you could, if you could, if you could accuse Cowboys from Hell of anything, you could say like it maybe was unfocused or they didn't know what direction they wanted to go in. On Vulgar or Display of Power, it is a band where everyone is on the same page, and and they they figured out that like okay, we're gonna take this extreme groove, this sludge, we're gonna make the vocals harder. Phil's only allowed to sing on like slow melodic songs, <laughs> you know, and um, we're just gonna go. For, we're just gonna go for the throat, essentially. This and album is so fucking dry. I want to be in the room when they turned up the faders and all they heard was Phil. <laughs> no fucking reverb. No fucking fancy shit. There's some reverb on the drums and in some of the melodic parts. But listen to fucking walk. Listen to a new level. Listen to fucking hostile. There is something to be said for the guitarist and the vocalist that make you pay attention because of how fucking intense they are and no extra bullshit. It's 1992. I should have heard that James Hetfield Black Album sound about how holier than thou you are. I'm going to keep going if you don't fucking catch up. Yeah, you know this one is is a lot of people's favorite Pantera record, and, and it makes a lot of sense why it would be. It's got highs, it's got lows, it's got you know ballads, it's got fucking hostile, which is like a crazy, insane punk song. You know, you've got this is a band that's been on tour for two years straight, playing clubs every night, seeing what works, what doesn't work, and you know they're going for it. There, there's no. There's no pulling back like a lot of the, you know, the glam bands at the time, you know, would have pulled back and wrote a, uh, an extreme, whatever that song was called. And, uh, you know, more acoustic stuff and trying to get on the on the radio and all that crap. And Pantera was like, nah, we're good. We're going to do this. And it absolutely worked. Does this album have the best fake out ballad of all time? Which is Hollow or This Love? Exactly. Yeah. Can you decide? Is there another song that you can think of that is melodic as hell and then right in the middle just blazes you with riffs? It's like the ultimate fuck you from Phil. Metallica's one's kind of like that. Kind of jams out at the end. A little bit, but that's more like it builds and builds and builds. This love is like, yeah, I'm really happy that you're here. Fuck you! (laughs) (laughs) There's a really funny, there's a really funny, like I said, I've been watching a lot of live videos. And uh, there's a really funny live video where Pantera is playing this love, and Phil says, <laughs> "I wouldn't." Uh... <laughs> he goes, "I wouldn't kill myself now. I've got too much money." <laughs> oh, nice! <laughs> it was hilarious. This fucking record, dude. Seriously, guitarists rejoice. It's fucking Pantera. It's vulgar display of power, and it's heavy as hell. Well, it's weird too because like Walk was like the leadoff single, right? And so it might lead somebody to believe that, oh my God, this is like some really basic shit, <laughs> you know. But if you actually listen to the record, you'll start you'll start realizing that you are still listening to the same band that put out Cowboys from Hell. It's just that 
they've they've just gone heavier. They figured it out. Yeah. And like I feel like I feel like dime solos are like way better here. Um just because they're what's the word? Like frenetic, I guess like Frenetic a word, I guess it is now because I said it on a podcast. <laughs> but uh, you're thinking of they're frantic. Phonetic, no, I'm thinking frantic. They're a little bit more frantic. D- they're a little d- bit more d- desperate, and um, <sighs> like I don't know. Like I, I really enjoy the the way they kind of cut through the uh, all the mud. <laughs> you know, it, like it's really um, and, and I wouldn't accuse like these albums of sounding muddy because they don't. They sound actually really good because it was like right before digital took. <laughs> took over so like this it still is all sounds, analog dude yeah it still sounds really good and analog and and in your face but what i what i like about the solos on this record is that they just are very complimentary to the song and it actually shows dime taking a little bit more of a uh restrained approach because like dude could just go off and it'd be just like guitar porn but it's it it shows that the band had a unified vision on this record of like okay, we got to be super heavy now, and we're gonna keep that up, but we're not gonna we're not gonna give up our metal roots. We're not gonna become a hardcore band. We're not we're gonna dumb our shit down, but they're gonna be a little. It's gonna be a little bit more restrained, because I guess like the concept of if you play an amazing solo in every single song, the song has to suffer, because all you, anybody cares about is this incredible solo. Whereas if you kind of make the audience wait for it, then it actually means something. And, and I saw that a lot on Vulgar Display of Power. Well, I've heard that a lot with the walk. So the uh, walk solo is he could, you know, the, the riff is so simple and he could have done anything could have been absolute guitar noodle and guitar porn, as you said. But he actually played a solo that I'm thinking about it in my head right now because you can hum it. And it's not a it's not an over the top solo. He he played like the perfect solo for that part. Yeah, absolutely. And like I mean, Walk is definitely not my favorite Pantera song, but I can still recognize that like there was restraint put there. That honestly, like nobody was expecting. Like, and and that that I guess that's where the respect comes from from me, and why I wanted to do another Pantera episode because there there is respect and there are things that need to be discussed. That, you know, a lot of bands or a lot of guitarists, a lot of the time, Joe included, fuck yeah, are um, very show offy. And it's not that Dimebag can't show off, but he it's, can, but it's, but it's very respectable that he knows when to hold off, but then also when to like, you know, <laughs> orgasm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's one of those, it's one of those things where that restraint shows a dedication to songwriting that I don't know that a lot of heavy bands in this vein are capable of. It's either be as brutal as fucking possible all the time, or it's let's show off how techy we are. And I think this is the album with, with like the, the by demons be driven riff alone is kind of like every metal band to this day, wish they wrote that riff and they, yeah. and they, and they've every, every metal band to this day has written a variation of that riff. I'm going to bring it back to Eddie Van Halen for just a second. Eddie Van Halen, who for many years got to play alongside David Lee Roth while he said on stage, the greatest guitarist in the whole world, Mr. Eddie Van Halen. I'm not saying it's not true, but he had this style of, I'm going to play the rhythm and the lead. I'm not just going to be the sole guitarist in the band. Dimebag is the only other guitarist I have ever heard who has truly mastered that balance but he did it a little bit differently because his wasn't about the blazing riff all the time. Sometimes it was about the groove and the lay off and the hold back. And he would make the lead into the riff. Who else can do it? I mean, I've been in bands with you, Joe. It's not you. <laughs> was that the... I was going to say Joe, so I don't know. I oh, guess okay. fuck you both. I play Perfect. fast all the time. All right, if Toomey listened to my record and said it was good, I'd like probably die right there on the spot. So Fuck. it's fine. Um, <laughs> I've seen I've seen video of you rocking a church. Somewhere. Oh yeah, yeah, we did rock some churches back in the day. That's for sure. Um, which is not really a, a really which is not really a theme that Pantera uh, respects. <laughs> you know. Uh, so, but what I what I really liked about this record is that like it is what's unique about it to me is that. If you have to pick a Pantera album that is going to be the most mainstream, wouldn't you think it would be Cowboys from Hell? But it's right. not. It's 
vulgar display of power. It's the most popular Pantera album, probably because it has Walk on it. But what's 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 fascinating to me about it is that the, this harder edged band is able to make their heavier album the more commercially successful one. And I think that just goes to show that people in the '90s were tired of overindulgent metal, like overindulgent solos and 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 you know, because I mean some of the some of these glam bands, man, they were playing like 20 minute fucking guitar solos and to no one like by '90 <laughs> by '92, I mean no one. <laughs> and uh you know pe- people people favored more of like just just write me a song like a song that's catchy and then i'm gonna like but you know it's the 90s so the world isn't really a great place anymore so i want to relate to that and pantera was like the perfect fucking pill for that just like during that year i think it's time to go far beyond driven i think so too if we're ever gonna finish this <laughs> 1994 Remember how I said the last record was a lot heavier? Yeah, well, I mean, if you guys are familiar with, uh, you know, the Talk To Me podcast, if you don't know the opening riff from I'm Broken, then, I mean, what the (laughs) fuck are we even doing here? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, Far Beyond Driven, dude, like, my favorite Pantera album, hands down. Like, if you can, if you, if I, Dan Terry, have a favorite Pantera album, it's (laughs) Far Beyond Driven. And, I you think know, you guys need to stop the podcast now. I think you we have we have come full circle. Dan is finally admitting to liking Pantera. It's over. It's a it was nice knowing everybody. Let's move on with life. <laughs> <laughs> and Joe's gone. <laughs> and Joe left. <laughs> and there there's a dog. But um, no, you know it's funny. This is this is the Pantera album I came in on. Uh, there was a special on Headbangers Ball. Like the weekend before this album came out, I, you know, obviously I used to uh, videotape or record every episode of Headbangers Ball, and I watched this episode all week, and it just showed the one thing we haven't really talked about is the the personalities of Pantera. You know, the how, you know, they filmed everything. They were goofy. They were hanging out. They were, you know, Dime was the life of the party wherever he went, and this really came through in this Headbangers Ball special about Far Beyond Driven, and then. Far Beyond Driven comes out, becomes the first heavy, like metal, metal record to go number one. Uh, you know, unless you ask Sebastian Bach and he'll say that was Slave to the Grind, another great album. But we, we're going to say that this is the first metal album to go number one on Billboard, 1994. Just completely, you know, slaps in the face of everything going on at that time. I mean, if you think about 1994, this is the height of grunge. This is the height of. You know, just goofy uh, stuff on the radio and, you, you know, even, uh, you know, Nirvana and, and Pearl Jam and Soundgarden. Like, that is the height of all of that. And Pantera's like, no, nah, we're going to do this. You're slaughtered. You know? Fuck. <laughs> well, and it's like I was saying before, like, even those old Pantera albums got progressively heavier. And so, like, you hear an album like Cowboys from Hell and you're like, oh, damn, <laughs> these guys are really stepping it up. And then you hear a record like Far Beyond Driven, and you're like, oh, damn. <laughs> I'm sorry. You hear an album like Vulgar Display of Power, and you're like, oh, damn. Like, they, they just took it and ran with it. So, like, by the time you get to Far Beyond Driven, it's like, oh, man, I don't even know if I can handle this. Because it is everything Vulgar Display of Power was, only more intense. And it's funny, too, because, like you said, the personality of the band that, like, these guys were kind of like, like fun dudes, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. um, you know, Phil notwithstanding. Uh, but even then, I think he was a fun dude, just like for some reason felt the need to. And adjust. drunk. And very drunk. I'm not even talking about Phil. I'm not going to pick on Phil tonight. I'm not going to pick on Phil at all, man. I, uh, I feel the need to mention this because people are going to be all like, why did you hate Pantera so much two years ago? And now like you're like licking their balls. Um, it's not, <laughs> it's not that it's literally just that, like, I had some weird personal reservations about Phil and, uh, I do another podcast called Brutally Speaking, where, uh, we actually spoke with the drummer of Phil and Selma and the Illegals and him and I had a lot of conversation about Phil and his personality. And, uh, we had some of that conversation on mic, which you guys heard and some off mic. And, um, it, it definitely gave me a new perspective on some of this stuff, you know? So with that being said, like, I don't want to say that my, like, like, let's be honest. Like, I think some of 
Phil's lyrics are fucking stupid. <laughs> but um, that doesn't make the band terrible. And it doesn't make the band not worth talking about. And, um, you know, everybody writes stupid lyrics. Like, I used to be in a Christian rock band called Jelly Donut. And I wrote some really <laughs> fucking stupid lyrics. Okay? So, like, I mean... Me insulting Phil's lyrical ability is kind of like the pot calling the kettle black <laughs> in a certain way. So I'm, I'm just, and that's why we, we've more or less avoided talking about lyrics on this discussion entirely. Uh, because I don't like think that Phil's the greatest lyricist. I do think that Phil is a great front man and is very, very animated and very much what the band needed. And, um, his personality also like like some of the some of the things that he's done that have been more controversial he's he's admittedly said like i was drunk or i was super high and i said some (laughs) shit that i don't like i don't even know what i said like he did like phil phil's the kind of guy that like got super super drunk or super super high or both and he was taking painkillers for back pain right now right and finds out the next day what he said (laughs) <laughs> you know and yeah. so like i mean and i've fucking been there man like uh not high but definitely drunk i mean even, even on this podcast like for instance when we did that uh mushroom head retraction earlier that we did earlier i was like oh fu-, like when when they started emailing me i was like did i say that i don't even remember if i said that <laughs> or not you know so i had to go back yeah. and listen to the episode and it was only then that i was like oh shit yeah you're right <laughs> you know i did say that um and and so like if i'm gonna say that kind of behavior is okay for me then i can't say that it's not okay for phil <laughs> you know it doesn't make any sense it's it's hypocritical yeah, i got you on a lighter note, my favorite part of this whole episode is the fact that I can no longer hear the music, but Joe can, and Joe is having the time of his life, and he looks like a psychopath because he's grinning and bobbing and, and jamming, but I can't hear any music, so oh, I think it's pretty funny. When I do the episodes for my house, I, I have to pull the music up myself in order to get the same experience. <laughs> but yeah, okay, so Far Beyond Driven, like let's get back onto the album. Um so what I originally said was they were all very drunk. I've seen the home movies. Mm-hmm. I've studied how great. to make an actual black tooth grin. <laughs> These guys loved having a fucking good time. They were trying to create their own mini rock star experience cuz there's those stories about being on the tour bus with all the booze and all the dudes and all the that were not dudes and all the fucking beer that you could fucking drink and other things. Toomey's been there. Yeah, I've actually been there with Pantera. There was a a great (laughs) story about uh, the 99 or 2000 OzFest. Thanks for taking that uh, from me. (laughs) I I, I took took a... uh, uh, I was at OzFest in St. Louis, actually, and we went to... um, uh, I was walking out, and I just broke up with my girlfriend at the time. I had like no job. We was I was still in the band, but uh, uh, the, the little uh, Carney thing said help wanted, and I was like, "What's this help wanted about?" And they're like, "Oh, well, you travel with Ozfest, and you set up these carnival games every day, and you know you make uh, like seventy five dollars a day, and you get free food." And I'm like, "Well, fuck, I'm leaving." And so I went back to my friends. I was like, "Hey, I'm leaving with Ozfest. I'll see you guys back in Nashville." And so for the next uh, week and a half, two weeks, I did like five OzFest. I set up these games every day, and uh, and Pantera was on that, so I got to see Pantera every day. But when we got to Dallas, they were like after after OzFest party at the clubhouse, which was Vinny's uh, strip club in Dallas. So I was like, all right, cool. So I got a ride over there. I go in. Everyone from every band is in there having a good time. But the, the main thing was Dime was walking around handing out shots. And then, like, uh, Phil was the DJ, so all the strippers would come out. He'd be like, next on stage is, you know, Sapphire. And then uh, Dime and uh, Vinny got up with, like, a, a Van Halen tribute band, played some Van Halen covers. So, yeah, it was a pretty intense night. That sounds awesome. I mean, I let's be honest. I was probably at church that night. 
Uh, but it's, you should have been, which I should have been too. You probably should have been. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I worry about your soul to me. I, I do. But anyway, uh, that, that's not the point of this discussion. So I mean, like beyond, was this a trick just to get me in here to talk about Jesus? Yeah. So would, would you, do you have an extra hour for me to talk to you about our Lord and Savior, <laughs> Philip hey, Dan, Anselmo? Two thousand three, Dan Colt. He said, "Josh, listen to Zayo." Well, if you want to know anything about, the, you know, what makes me cooler than Dan is I saw Zayo in the 90s, so I don't even want to talk about it. Fuck yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I just posted a I just posted a picture on Instagram, and the guitarist from Zayo liked it, so, you know, whatever. Oh, well, you're, you, you got me. I got street cred and shit. <laughs> I'm still, like, to try to get on, get on Furnace Fest, but anyway. There's that fucking beat, dude. Really? <laughs> anyway. Uh, I was the roadie for Marty Lund. My for Game like is on ten, two is minutes, on point. but anyway, uh, but yeah, really, far beyond driven. Other than <laughs> other than good friends and a bottle of pills, which is my absolute worst, the, my least favorite Pantera song of all time. It's terrible. I mean, it's it's an interlude at best. Everybody has to have those every now. And I then, mean, though. it's not the best decision they ever made on like leaving a song on the album. But like, was anybody like really surprised? Like, I even asked myself that question. Like, after we posted the original Pantera episode, I went back and listened to it, and I was like, what the fuck did you expect? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, you know, back then, like, I mean, this is this is when Phil was, like, because they had put out Cowboys from Hell, and they had put out Vulgar Display of Power. Why would you not think that Phil was full of himself? I'd be fucking full of myself at that point. You know, so yeah, he's going to put out something dumb like that, but like that's not representative of the album as a whole. And me being more of a fan of like super brutal shit, it doesn't get much more brutal than Far Beyond Driven. And I mean, well, maybe like the Great Southern Trend Kill, but we'll get to that. <laughs> but like, I think it's time. Well, we haven't even talked about Far Beyond Driven. I mean, we haven't talked about the amazing cover of Planet Caravan. That's on that album, and uh, literally one of my favorite Pantera songs, even though it's a Black Sabbath song. You know, like <laughs> I, I like, and here and here's why I like Pantera's cover of Planet Caravan more, is because it sounds more modern. Like it's still '90s, but it sounds better than like the original Black Sabbath version because I have that on vinyl. <laughs> you know, and it it sounds awesome. It's a great song, but I like hearing it with like better production and phil does yeah, an incredible and, job and this is like the like i said earlier this is when i got into pantera this is when i started to go see them live you know i got to see uh pantera 94 at like uh the big amphitheater in nashville coming out doing you know becoming which is one of my favorite all-time riffs and then you know you've got the classics i mean even the singles on this album don't get me don't get as played out as walk does so i mean even i'm broken and five minutes alone still stand up but i mean you know like strength beyond strength and slaw i mean this is just a, a banger after banger album you know aside from good friends and a bottle of pills which I, I think it's just the you know the subject matter of that song because i mean even the uh the screaming and stuff and good friends and a bottle of pills is kind of cool yeah. yeah i mean you just keep going through this whole album of just like hit after hit after hit for me and uh, yeah, this is definitely a, a life changer of an album. Yeah, I mean, use my third arm, probably one of my favorite Pantera songs, just because it's so fucking heavy. And uh, you know, even uh, Five Minutes Alone, great song, has a great story behind it. Whereas you know, the band was playing a show and there was a guy heckling Phil on stage. Heaven forbid, right? Like if I'd been around in the '90s, that probably <laughs> would have been me. Yeah, let's be honest. And. Uh, you know, Phil was basically like, you know what? I'm going to turn the crowd against you. And he had the crowd beat the shit out of this dude. <laughs> and uh, then the guy's dad, like, tried to sue. I guess he tried to sue Pantera or tried to sue the venue. I don't remember which. I don't remember all the details. But uh, he said that he would just, like, five minutes alone with Phil Anselmo. And Phil Anselmo was like, that's all I need to beat your ass. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and so that like that's kind of cool and it, it like it's not cool in the like you know like people have accused me of being a social justice warrior if you guys could even see the hate mail i've gotten over the original pantera episode uh but <laughs> some of the points that they bring up are valid some of them are not but uh one of the things was you know people accuse me of being a social justice warrior but like i think a song like five minutes alone 
you know, back when we did that episode, like, dude, like, I'm going to be totally transparent. Like, nobody was listening to our podcast back then. <laughs> you know, nobody was. And um, so I didn't really understand what it felt like to be targeted by people or to be heckled, you know, unnecessarily by people. Whereas, like, now, like, three years later, like, after we started, we've been doing this a while, I definitely can understand what it's like to be heckled by people for no reason. And so when I listen to a song like Five Minutes Alone, I'm like, fuck yeah, dude, Phil Phil got it. <laughs> like, 100%. Like, you know, people are going to talk a bunch of shit, and they're going to try to say, they're going to try to attribute things to you that are not your fault. And, like, yeah, dude, like, I totally stand by that song. Like, 100%. Five Minutes Alone, one of the best fucking Pantera songs ever, because it speaks the truth. And yeah, it's it's coming from a guy that was self-medicating with morphine you know like i self-medicate with nicotine there you go you know like i get it <laughs> like a hundred percent and so like i i definitely have understood where phil's coming from on some of these songs like from a from a more personal perspective it's been it's been a lot of growth in two years guys it's been a lot of growth step one come to terms with your ailment step two well s- step three is profit but you well, get yeah, the idea. we'll get there at some point. But I think that I think the biggest <laughs> thing is that, like, you know, this is a band that, you know, they were basically nobody when they were putting out their glam albums. Like, they were a band that, like, if a bigger band came into town, like, maybe they'd get to open for them, you know, and they'd play a lot of they'd play a lot of uh, <laughs> they, they, they'd play a lot. You're fucking derail- derailing me, Joe. Uh, they're Sorry, playing, dude. They're playing a lot of. Um, <laughs> like local shows and stuff and they were a local sensation or whatever but like they weren't anybody yet so they wrote about stuff that wasn't real life and i feel like from it, at the very least from vulgar display on the lyrics were very real life whether i whether i agree with them or not i felt like phil got super super personal and super like this is what i'm dealing with right now like within the next five minutes I mentioned it in passing songs. earlier, but he was heavily medicated with back pain, right? Well, if I remember correctly, Phil was like using heroin and alcohol to self-medicate. And the reason was was because they basically told him, like, you've got to take a break from the band. Like, you've got to go on tour or you can't go on tour. But it's like at that time, Pantera was still blowing up like... All throughout the 90s, it was like, we have to take these shows. We have to do these tours. We have to take these opportunities. I understand that he felt the need to self-medicate. I mean, I don't agree with it. Like, I mean, obviously heroin's like not good news, but like, I, I can kind of see how he got there and that like, it was available and it didn't require him to, you know, go to a doctor and take time off from touring and all that. So like, I'm not saying it's okay, but. I understand at least how we got there, you know. So I, I guess I, I guess we can move on. Sorry, I'm just you know we, we kind of keep going back to the early the glam glam days of Pantera, and I always kind of look at them like, you know, when when power metal came out, Phil and Selma would have been 19, and so right, yeah, Cow, well, Cowboys from Hell comes out, he's 20, what 2021. So I mean, you, you you're watching a kid grow up basically in in the spotlight, and so you've got a you've got a kid. Or you've got a group of kids that were putting together basically their early demos just because their dad had a recording studio basically in their house to be able to put out. So, I mean, it's like if, you know, if you and, and you know, Dan and Joe's band from when you guys were 13 put out albums up until you were 20 and then 20 you got signed. And then you kind of, you know, those albums when you were 13 still have the same band name. You know, it's kind of a, a hard thing to get away from. But yeah, you're, you know, you're the thing with Phil is, you know, like we said, you know, he's 20, 21 when Cowboys from Hell comes out. So you're you're watching a, a, a young man mature. So by the time Far Beyond Driven comes out, he's about 25. So, I mean, he's still a kid. I mean, think about it. God, 25 is still a kid to me. But it's crazy, crazy to think that they were that big, that young. I feel like if it wasn't Pantera. We would be giving them shit for not changing the band name when they clearly changed the style. Right. But it's Pantera. So, fuck yeah. <laughs> you know, and this is totally a uh, side uh, side 
side thing here. Let me pull this up. Because I always think about how young Pantera was. So let's see. So Phil Anselmo is currently 51. Howard Jones from Kill Switch Light the Torch is 49. So, I mean, it's an insane, it, you know, they're two years apart, but yet, you know, Phil seems like he's been in the, you know, the music, in, our, in the spotlight since he was, uh, you know, since for so long, he feels like he should be so much older, but yet, you know, Howard Jones, Kill Switch Engage, Light the Torch is, is you know, two years younger than him. 1996, The Great Southern Trend Kill. Well, I don't know if we can talk about this without talking about kind of what went down between Phil and the band members. As, as we've mentioned before, you know, Phil was self-medicating with alcohol or, let's be honest, whatever he had available. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the band members kind of noticed that Phil was kind of distancing himself. Because, I mean, if you if you look at the videos, you look at, look at a lot of the stuff that took place in the early days... Phil was kind of just like, he was there, but he wasn't like super emo or to himself or, you know, anything like that. He was just, a, he was just a, like, for lack of a better term, a goofball, you know, just like everybody else. You get to this era of Pantera where they're at the height of their success and Phil starts distancing himself from the band and kind of being aloof. And the band members think initially that like, well, maybe the success is starting to go to his head. Or that he's starting to think that he's more, you know, than we are, which is stupid, right? Because we describe Pantera as a as a perfect storm, like the perfect mm -hmm. perfect members, perfect storm of intensity. Exactly. So they start not getting along. They start having disagreements about things, and this is something that I'm not sure if it's fact or not. They that Phil basically recorded this album apart from the rest of the band. Like that he had distanced himself that much at this point. He was doing down, and I'm sure something else that I can't remember at this exact moment, but the band was recording music, and he's in a completely different studio doing all the vocals, and it still sounds like Pantera. Josh Toomey, please correct all of my mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. I mean, he recorded his vocals in New Orleans away from the band at Trent Reznor's Nothing Studios in New Orleans. Uh, you know, this is the time where uh, I had some ends with the Pantera camp. And so we would go to shows and they would and, you know, they would point at one bus. That's Phil's bus. This bus over here is the rest of the band's bus. Like they were they were riding on separate buses. They were definitely growing apart at this time. Um, but still, and, uh, you know, this is sacrilege to a lot of people. And I've made this many this comment many a time. The Great Southern Trend Kill is my favorite Pantera album. What's wrong with that? Well, really? I okay. disagree, well, but what's wrong with that? Well, yeah. I'm just saying most people go, you know, vulgar display of power like you do, Joe. But I mean, I think that, you know, the, we, we, you know, you've made the comment many a time on this, Dan, where, the, you know, they were getting heavier and heavier as, as they went along. And, you know, this is almost like a culmination of heavy. The drums are insane. You know, 13 Steps to Nowhere is, is probably one of my favorite opening drum lines ever. Suicide, night, suicide, suicide Note Part 2. I mean, how can you go wrong there? You got Floods, which has got like the, you know, which is considered like the greatest guitar solo of all time, which for a long time I didn't get that until like recently I went back and listened to it. And I was like, you know what? This Floods guitar solo is actually pretty damn good. But as for an album, man, you know, the the whole album is heavier and heavier and heavier. And I've always almost kind of attested that they got better as they went along. I think that Cowboys Hell is good. Vulgar is better. Far Beyond Driven's better. You know, the, and then it culminates in the Great Southern Trend Kill. As you know, I always wondered where they would go from there. And I think that they continue to get better as a band. And this is by far my favorite album. See, I think this album sounds the most chaotic and thrown together but i admit i'm the least familiar with it i have spent mm -hmm. more time listening to vulgar display of power far beyond driven reinventing the steel which in my experience is the record people don't like if you like all of the pantera albums but when i listen to this it doesn't sound like a band working together the abbott brothers are obviously doing their thing rex is there but then there's more space than I would expect where Phil is not performing. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't sound like they did these apart, but it also doesn't sound like they were tight on this record. I don't know if I agree with that because 
I think controversial statement here, but like I think that Suicide Note Part One and Suicide Note Part Two are worth the price of admission alone. They, <laughs> like they really are, because like that it was you know because I'm I'm working and I, I listen I'm listening to these records and I'm thinking like the the, the fucking like change of mood between those two songs is so like jarring that it's profound like i can't believe how extreme that is and not only that but like they they definitely have like a i i don't know like like whenever you say it's not as together not as in sync on those two songs especially it seems like a very unified vision like it's hard to really quantify in words, but like those songs like really grabbed me. And th- honestly, I've listened to these songs like a million fucking times before I did this week for this episode, and it didn't grab me. I was like, eh, whatever. It's like, Suicide okay. Notes 1 and 2 are like hollow taken to the next extreme. That idea of the slow song that builds and explodes and closes out the record, they are absolutely that. But for me, the album as a whole doesn't work as well as the other records. I don't know, though, because I think that it edges out. I think it edges out far beyond Driven in that the heavier parts are heavier. Pantera always gets heavier. Every every album, they, they try to push what the boundary is, what, whatever the limit is or whatever the perceived limit is. They always try to push that. Hey, Dime, how can we get some more low end right here? Right. I don't know, dude. I've pretty much maxed it out, but... You know, I can call these guys and have a new head made for my amp, and we'll just see what happens. But I mean, have I have I mentioned that like Frank this is died. still wasn't out, on this record. This is out. <laughs> this is outrageously brutal for a band with one guitarist. Oh <laughs> but, yeah, you know, like, without question. I mean, I, I can't overstate that enough. Like when whenever we listen to bands for the show, the first thing I check is like how many guitarists do they have? Okay, they got three. <laughs> okay, it's fine. Pantera sounds like three in one because there's so many different mindsets into what Dime plays. You know, one minute he's like the most brutal fucking guitarist on earth. And then the next minute it's like very soulful, very melodic. And then the next minute it's like neck breaking shred. You know, it's crazy about this. And you got to think about the time, you know, we've talked about the, the pre Cowboys albums being kind of in the grunge era or the, glam era and then the early pantera stuff is throughout the grunge era but music in 96 you know i'm listening to a lot of corn a lot of deftones a lot of this new metal is starting to creep up sepultura yeah sepultura all that stuff is is coming coming out and you know not only do they not do that they get heavier and heavier and you got to think metallica is doing load and reload at this time and you know megadeth's doing whatever god knows what at this time i mean everybody's kind of like yeah, they, they, yeah, they're doing a risk. So everybody's kind of taking a left turn, and, and Pantera is just trudging through, like keeping this type of metal just alive. I mean, if anything, man, you know, Pantera should be commended for what they did in the '90s uh, for every album that they did, no matter no matter which one you go to, because no matter what the trend was at the time, and I can, no pun intended, because <laughs> they were the great Southern trend kill. But I mean, you, you know, I remember buying this album. And I was probably wearing a corn hoodie, you know, at the time. <laughs> and so, and some Jinkos or something. But um, so everything was just, just changing around them, but they were still not only staying the same, but getting heavier. Absolutely. They, they always continued that trend of being heavier, of, of pushing the line, pushing the boundary. And like as a, as a, you know, hardcore fan or a, or a extreme metal fan, like I, I have to kind of respect that because they always stayed true to what they were because i mean yeah you can say like obviously like far beyond driven and even vulgar display of power were um they were on a different planet than cowboys from hell but when you look at the overall theme like the fact that they called the record the great southern trend kill is kind of genius in that like they were like yeah we're not following trends we're just we're just being the band that we have always been but we're going to keep pushing it. We're going to keep pushing forward. We're going to we're going to push forward in what we do, but we're not necessarily concerned with what like everyone else is doing in 96. You know, and that that that's respectable. Like it's 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 like yeah, we're staying true to it at a time where, you know, metal was kind of up for grabs. 
for a lot of people. A lot of people that were into metal in that in that time, you know, maybe moved on to rap or maybe moved on to like new metal. Not that new metal wasn't like influenced by Pantera. There's definitely mm -hmm. an argument that it was. Uh, but like their like the guitar the guitar riffs were far more brutal than they had ever been while still having that southern groove you know and still having that identity that 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 trademark like you know like in in modern times it'd be like there's like a there's like a water stamp <laughs> you know on on all of those riffs where you know you you know you guys m famously made fun of me for saying you know or you know by saying that like when you hear Dimebag playing like you can always tell it's him there's, there's no, mm -hmm. you know, th there's no interpretation. There's no, uh, th th there's no um, mistaking him for someone else. He had a very distinctive sound, even though he played a variety of styles throughout his career. And so, to be able to go this extreme, and and, and some of the stuff I, I, you know, I, and as much as I hate to say it, like some of the things I like the most about the Great Southern Trend Killer is the vocal variety. How Phil can go from this like soulful like emotional you know singing to like fucking pterodactyl screams <laughs> um <laughs> fucking fucking deep gutturals like, like i said I've, i watched so many live Van pantera videos this week and like there's times where, where phil just goes into like dude you're fully immersed yeah like he goes he goes directly into like these like guttural death metal vocals you know like like <laughs> and uh he doesn't do that on the record but he does it on on he does it live and uh it's like he's just like throwing it out to people that like yeah pantera might be a mainstream band but we're still doing whatever the fuck we want you know absolutely and how many bands could say that during that era it makes it makes fucking load sound like fucking a reload kid music like <laughs> like yeah re, re, yeah load and reload like <laughs> like fucking it sounds like what it is it's a fucking Alice in Chains record it's like except Justin, it's Metallica come it's on just guys like, it's like Justin Bieber compared to what Pantera was throwing don't down don't you spoil the name of Kirk Hammett like that I mean I don't think Kirk Hammett's a bad guitar player but you know he's James not, Hetfield will meddle all over your ass uh, he you know he's good he's no dime bag you know, and there's other guitarists that I like more than Dimebag, but it's fine. It's We're not, not talking about official that's live, not, that's not but the point. all that's that not. shit that you just said about the band, but let he me, does that on the live record. Let me preface this, though, <laughs> by saying that, yes, there are guitar players that I like more than Dimebag Daryl. Chuck Schuldner. Chuck Schuldner. I love Chuck, but, like, you know, as Josh said on the original Pantera episode, put those dudes in a room together. Who wouldn't want to hear that? <laughs> right. You know? But it's it's kind of asinine considering how different both of their styles were to try to compare them to one another as to who's better. Like it's stupid, you know. Like let's just be music fans, and if that were to ever if that had actually ever happened, we would have just loved to hear it. <laughs> you know, um, I don't know if they would have fit very well, but <laughs> it's still like one of those most of the most of the guitarists that I'll throw out there and say are better than Diamond McDaryl are people that came after. Dimebag Daryl, and that's important because they had that. They had that as a base to start from, and and I think that's I think that's the important thing that we left out on the original episode was that I can say that there's a guitar player, you know, because like yeah, sure, fuck yeah, there there's probably a thousand guitar players out there right now that are putting out YouTube videos and then getting their riffs stolen by flaw, but like uh, <laughs> that, 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 that might be better than what we consider to be the greatest guitar players in the world, but they wouldn't be where they are if they didn't have that. The one thing with Dimebag and his solos and everything else, I mean, I've, I may have even said that on the original uh, podcast with you guys, but you go see a band cover a Pantera song. It might sound okay until the solo comes up. And then you just, then you realize like, no, that guy's not dime bag. Like he could even play the notes, but there's just still something missing because he's not feeling the notes. He might play the correct notes, but he's not playing them just right enough. Right. You brought it up earlier. Everybody's talking about how do you get Phil and Rex and Zach Wild on stage and do a Pantera set. Everything you just said about dime bag, Zach Wild can't do that. He's his right. own thing. He's his own version of loud as fuck, fast as fuck. But compared to Dimebag, he sounds like a technician 
who's trying to play as fast as he is, and he gets there, but he doesn't feel the fucking solo. He's just blazing for the sake of fucking blazing. Well, I mean, I'm yeah, not going to... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was just saying, when they keep bringing up Zach, I think it's not, not necessarily his playing. Obviously, he can play the parts. Right, it's the I'm kinship. Saying, I think it's, it's the it's fact the that kinship, they were friends. The friendship. You know, yeah, it's that it's that whole side of it too. You know, I've, and that would have been cool. Be, that absolutely would have been cool. You know, it would be cool to do it. John Five, give me John Five playing Dimebag parts, and I'll take it every day. Ladies and gentlemen, Josh Toomey just booked the show. <laughs> Let's make it happen. <laughs> Who's gonna play drums? I'll throw some fucking sponsorship money down on that. <laughs> give, me, but, uh, give me Chris Adler. He ain't doing anything right now. Chris Adler. We get Scott Bowling to throw some sponsorship money down. <laughs> It'd be awesome. <laughs> but, uh, you know. You mean our good friend down in Atlanta, Georgia, Scott Bowling? Our best friend in the entire fucking world <laughs> down in Atlanta, Georgia, Scott Bowling. You know he's listening to this. Yeah, he, I, we love he's you, listening. Scott. We love you, Scott. We really do. I just, I want to hug you. I've done it before. I'll do it again. But anyway, um, I think I think what's, what's fun about... Not, not not necessarily fun, but like... Let me finish the point about how they did not follow the trend. Do I it. think if Pantera follows a trend they in 1996, the trend. then it sounds like Damage Plan, except Phil's doing the vocals. <laughs> Does anybody want that? I don't think they do. I don't think in 96, if Damage Plan comes out, except Phil and Selmo's doing the vocals... I don't think anybody would have liked that. Look, dude. That's I mean, not the same as we did power metal, and then we did cowboys, and then we went with it. Pantera was about the onslaught, the riffs, and move forward. Nobody wanted Pantera to play new metal. Well, they didn't. I mean, it's fine. <laughs> they didn't, but they did take new metal bands on tour with them. So They did. But the, the, in the one thing, and I know this isn't a tourography discussion, but the tours at this time, this was the uh, Pantera White Zombie co-headlining tour talk about a show like that was fire and dragons and flames and then white zombie comes out and, you know, so how the... was it backstage josh uh you know i was not backstage on that one well i might have been but uh <laughs> he wasn't a, he wasn't a legendary podcaster then <laughs> but no. uh you know i think i think it's interesting when when talking about this record in that i know a lot of fan a lot of fantera fans i know a lot of pantera fans that fell off during the Great Southern Trend Kill. And I can't figure out exactly why. I mean, I have a theory, and I think I think what it is is that... It had to be the controversy. What controversy? I don't remember there the being... The fact that the band was not getting along and Phil was doing what Phil does at the time. Right, but I mean, that was every band that was at their level but at that time. But the question is, why did people fall off? Because drama. The only reason that real fans fall off is drama. I think because assholes got tired of metal. <laughs> like, that's just my opinion. I mean, th th there's people that love metal for life, and then there's people that hop kind of on to a trend and, like, are into something for a certain period of time, and then they decide that they're not into that anymore. And, like, I feel like with Pantera, yeah, you can say, yeah, sure, there was controversy with Great Southern Trend Kill, but, like, as a record, I don't, I don't personally hear that controversy on the record you know um i hear may, i mean i guess if you're like an audio engineer like joe is i can't imagine to, like to be that but like um from my perspective i don't hear that on this record it sounds like another pantera record i think it's not necessarily as hard as far beyond driven was in that i mean the heavier songs are probably heavier than Far Beyond Driven, but I feel like they kind of went in some more melodic directions on this record. Not in like a pop way, but just more of like in an expressive way. And so like that that's why I think this record is actually one of the most well-rounded Pantera records, because you've got Cowboys, which is well-rounded, but it's kind of unfocused. You have uh, Vulgar Display, which is just all heavy, but not as heavy as, uh, not as, heavy as Far Beyond Driven. Far Beyond Driven is all heavy for the most part. And then you get to Southern Trend Kill and they start kind of in introducing that melody back into the sound. So, I mean, I think that it makes total sense uh, musically, like where it's at, which I guess brings us to, you know, Steel was a thing, but before 2000, but they have apparently reinvented it. Hellbound kicks this one off. 
this might have been the first record by Pantera that I bought on CD. So I had that increased audio quality, and I thought this was the thickest fucking thing ever. Wait, you didn't start buying CDs till 2000? No, this was the first Pantera record <laughs> that I had on CD. All right, all right, whatever. You motherfucker. <laughs> hey, man, I was late to the CD game. I'm not going to lie. I was real late to it. Love my cassettes. <laughs> I would buy both, whichever one was cheaper. I didn't know the difference, and my Walkman was still a cassette. Nice. <laughs> Despite how the band may have been getting along or are not getting along at this point, I mean, this, this is towards the end, and this is kind of one of the hardest records to talk about, but it's also a really hard record. So, I mean, like, goddamn electric? I mean, come on. <laughs> Death Rattle? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yesterday we'll don't mean shit. for a long time. Fuck. Yesterday don't mean shit. You know, it's one of those things where everybody looks back on this album and, and it's kind of like the, the forgotten Pantera album almost. But then you actually put it on and you're like, man, these songs hold up too. Like, it's just like, like to me, Pantera just progressively got better. And even, you know, like I said, the Great Southern Trend Kill is probably my favorite album, but this album got heavy and, and it was still great. You know, the, as the, the heavy version of Pantera, the five studio albums they put out, you know, not a clunker in the bunch. You know, there's not a there's not a you know music from the elder by Kiss in there in their collection. There's not even a good friends in a bottle of pills on this record. No, not at all. You know, and um, Revolution is my fucking name. But like, I just think that like I don't know. This record really showed that number one, props for it being the same band. Yeah. All the way back to Cowboys, it's the same band. And if you compare the type of, of controversy or not getting along that the band had in comparison to other popular bands at the time, I mean, the fact that they kept the same lineup this far into their career is very admirable because no matter how they might have felt about each other, they at least recognized that this is a perfect storm. You, you cannot have Pantera without these elements, you know, and they, they have to be there. And regardless of how they may have felt personally they all still performed at the same level that they always had and that's a level of professionalism that we don't really see with more modern bands yeah man just just this album just crushes too and like i said it's kind of the forgotten one and obviously all this stuff happened you know after this album and the breakup and then the last shows and all that stuff and yeah but you know so it's kind of i guess leaves a sour taste in everyone's mouth on this album but yeah man what a classic from uh, from start to finish on this one too yeah totally i mean they killed it and i think what was sad about this too like the thing that i found the most depressing about the pantera story was that you know they recorded this album right and um you know phil had said that he was like gonna take a year off because of I guess him dealing with September 11th it was not a good time. Well, but he but he said that like he said, oh, "Okay, I'm going to I'm going to take a year off." He got his back fixed before this, right? I don't rem- I don't know that. I wish but- I could remember the timeline specifically, but I remember some point between 96 and 2000, he was gone. He was doing that, but then he also did down, so a lot of stuff going on in addition to what you're talking well, about. Well, he didn't just do down. He did down and super joint. But he's Dude, telling... Fucking super joint. I haven't listened to them in a while. But he's telling the Abbott brothers, I need time off to deal with September 11th. And, <laughs> and you know, after down goes on tour and super joint goes on tour, they're like, bullshit. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like you're, you're out you're, you're out touring with, the, with your other bands and you're not spending time with your main monkey main monkey main money maker which I'm leaving is that in okay that's fine <laughs> uh you're not you're not spending time with your main money maker which is pantera and i mean that ultimately led them to get frustrated understandably frustrated and they're like okay well if phil doesn't want to do pantera and like we've said throughout this whole episode like if you don't have all the ingredients for pantera you can't have pantera so they can't hire another singer because people will be pissed. So they basically disband Pantera in what was it, 2003? They're like, okay, I guess yeah, I Phil's the never about that time. Yeah, they're like, I guess Phil's never coming back. <laughs> you know, I guess that's it. And uh, so they formed Damage Plan. And we're not here to talk about the Damage Plan album. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, Roach Coach actually uh, 
did a retrospective, well, not a retrospective, but they did a review of uh, of the Damage Plan album, so you guys can go listen to that. And, um, you know, it's it's obviously different than Pantera, and unfortunately, like, I think after Damage Plan was a thing, you know, everybody started talking about, like, oh, when are we going to get the Pantera reunion? When are they coming back? I know they said they're done, but they got to come back, right? They got to come back. They're one of the biggest metal bands of the world. They have to come back. And uh, unfortunately, at a Damage Plan show, uh, an individual uh, decided to make a decision that was going to affect everyone. And um, unfortunately, uh, Dimebag was killed on stage at a Damage Plan show. And um, I don't have a lot to say about that other than, like, how do you kill the nicest guy in the world? I mean, honestly, I mean, from from all accounts, all the interviews, for all for all you fuckheads that think that I don't do research on the episodes before we do them, um, <laughs> I've listened. I've listened to almost every interview. I've listened to a lot of the interviews that even even Toomey has done with people that were part of the Pantera camp. There there was never anything to suggest that Dimebag Daryl was anything other than the nicest dude on planet Earth. That also had a gift. He was an instigator of the party. But I mean, of the party. Like, who the fuck hates a party? <laughs> um, but like, you know, he. It's it's a tragedy, and I, I wanna I wanna take a special moment to point out that back when we did the Pantera episode, I had said that you know, like somebody was like, "Oh, Pantera, they're coming to get you. The Cowboys from Hell are coming to get you," and I made a comment along the lines of, you know, uh, "Oh, well, only some of them will." <laughs> that 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 was really out of line, and 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 really insensitive, and um and I feel bad for saying it. You know, I I think when I look back on that original Pantera episode, you know, I we did that because I had said that I didn't like Pantera that much, and that you know I I didn't like them as a band, and that people people started getting really really pissed off that I didn't like Pantera like. Like, I was required to like Pantera as a metal fan, to be a metal fan. And we kind of did that episode as, like, a big fuck you to people like that. But And to you. Yeah, but that doesn't... (laughs) But at the same time, that that doesn't excuse making light of a situation like that. I mean, it was a horrible tragedy. And we we really lost something really important that night. So I just don't want to... I don't want to understate that. And, And that, you know... Even if even if Dimebag had continued only with Damage Plan for the next you know fifteen twenty years, fine, <laughs> you know, um, right? Because the, there there's no understa- understating what he did, and um, it just sucks, you know. Like that's the reason why we have secure more security on stages, and we have we you know like there was just something that you know I in a lot of ways equate it to the murder of John Lennon. Which was kind of like not exactly the same situation, but kind of similar. You know, I know they the yeah. impact on the industry. Yeah, like they they never really like necessarily concretely understood why this person uh, went into a venue and shot up a whole bunch of people. Um, I don't I don't know if they ever got definitive evidence. There there's been rumors that he was disappointed at Pantera's breakup, or that um, he was mentally unstable. He was mentally unstable and. I think the truth probably lies somewhere in the middle. It's probably a combination of those things. It's just, it was a horrible tragedy. And, you know, I apologize to anybody that was upset at what thing that I said because I thought it was funny <laughs> at the time. See, dude, you misspoke a little bit earlier. You said something about how nobody was listening to our podcast. There were a lot of people that listened to our podcast, many of them that still do. Apparently there Hopefully were people that were listening. all of them. <laughs> and it was pretty funny when you mentioned you didn't like Pantera and the joke spiraled from there. Newer listeners probably don't know that that show was a joke. At no point during or after that show did we call up our buddy Josh Toomey and he says, don't talk to me, guys. You said horrible things about Pantera. That didn't happen. <laughs> I don't think you guys have ever called me for anything. <laughs> Who calls anybody anymore? Well, you butt dialed me the other day. Yeah, I did do that. He butt dialed me once too, and then it was a long conversation. Anyway, well, I mean, and (laughs) just to clear the air, like, you know, this is one of those things where, and I actually equate equate this a lot to our living sacrifice episode. You've been equating a lot tonight. I felt like the band didn't deserve for that to be their episode. You know, 
And so I, I've definitely felt that way for the past two years about Pantera in the sense that, like, they don't really deserve that to be their episode. And um, a lot of the things with Phil, too, you know, a lot of things changed for me personally when, you know, I interviewed Joey from The Illegals uh, on Brutally Speaking. And um, there was all this weird, like, leading up to it. People were like, oh, my God, what is he going to say? Like, John, do you even want to let Dan talk on this interview? Because <laughs> he's going to say some shit that's going to be offensive or whatever. But instead of instead of making a bunch of accusations and launching into it, I did something that's a little different for me, and I listened. I listened to what Joey had to say about Phil, about his interactions with Phil. And even in leading up to this episode, I talked a lot about, or I read a lot about Phil and the supposed racism and and, and all that stuff. You know, like Phil, like, yeah, Phil had that dime bash incident where he said white power on stage. But it's funny because, like, I've listened to a lot of Pantera videos and watched a lot of Pantera videos this week. That is not the only time Phil has said white power on stage. <laughs> um, even, it just happens to be the first he, result on YouTube. Right, right. Even even by a long shot. And um, But you listen to what Phil says in interviews, and he says, like, I said that. I shouldn't have said that. That was stupid. And so I've, and, you know, when I talked to Joey from the Illegals, he's like, well, how can this dude be racist it's very, if every if everybody from this band is mixed race, like, or, or from a different race than Phil, like, how does that work? Like, how, how, if this dude's a racist, why is he, like, a really good friend of mine and, like, gave me a job and, you know, and, and all of this stuff? And it definitely, it definitely changed my opinion on Phil. And even um, whenever we did that interview, you know, John sent me a, a screenshot where Phil had actually texted Joey and said, Hey, tell these guys mad props for delivering the actual news and not throwing their own opinion onto it. And it was so, like, you have to understand how weird that was for me after, like, doing that Pantera episode. And then, <laughs> you know, like, like here I am, you know, a year later, and I'm like, you know, maybe I was wrong about this. Or maybe, maybe, I, maybe I spoke too soon or whatever. And um, I will say this. Phil, Phil has said some... some Comment has, has made some comments over the years that could be interpreted as racist. As racist, however, what I see a lot of the time is that whenever he's doing that, he's under the influence of a substance of some sort. That doesn't necessarily make it okay. I mean, you can make the argument that when you're under the in control, when you're under the control of a substance, you might say things that are more indicative of your character. What I what I see more of with that is maybe Phil might struggle with stuff like that sometimes like he might struggle with having racist feelings you know what he grew up in like what new orleans you know yeah. and so like though those were places that you know earlier in the decade were more segregated and might have had racist leanings and it's hard when you grow up in a society that feels a certain way about something so i i kind of interpret it more now as maybe this is something that maybe phil just struggles with a little bit like knows objectively that it's not correct and actually does try to remedy it when he can uh which is more admirable like what's what's more admirable than self-improvement which is what yes. i'm which is what i'm trying to do with this episode you know like 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 <laughs> with uh with, with a little bit of self-improvement come on dude don't spin it around and make it about you now. i'm not making it about me and actually <laughs> it's always about dan and actually no i'm not making it about me well like <laughs> one of the actual things too is that like there was a quote in uh in uh, Rolling Stone magazine in 2015 where they interviewed Phil and he said that it was kind of regrettable that the band used, you know, Confederate flags as on, like on their merchandise and, and in a lot of their marketing. Uh, he said, we did that because we were Leonard Skinner fans. He's like, but looking back on it, you know, a lot of people will say like, oh, it's it's heritage and not hate. And Phil himself, Phil Philip H. Anselmo himself said, yeah, I don't know if I buy into the whole heritage, not hate thing. <laughs> you know, he, he's like, I don't yeah. know. I don't necessarily know if that's true. And uh, so, I mean, that, that, that went a long way with me as far as, as far as being like, you know, maybe Phil says some things sometimes, but like, he's not perfect and I'm not perfect and Joe's not perfect and Josh is not perfect. And you know what I mean? Like, like, it, like how far do you want to take something? You know, because at the end of the day, Phil still fronted one of the best metal bands of all time. There you go. You know, and, and so you deserve 
you deserve credit for the things that you did right. And if you did something wrong, as long as you're like, yeah, I did that wrong, I, I should probably fix that. I feel like Phil has tried to do that. And so I'm, I'm, I, I don't, I'm not going forward like super upset with Phil Anselmo. And, um, I think it's terrible what happened with Dimebag Daryl and, and Vinnie Paul passing shortly afterwards. And that, that Pantera reunion that everybody wanted, unfortunately, is kind of really in danger of not happening whenever you've only got like two guys left. Would that be your final thought? You want that to be my final thought? You want me to shut the fuck up? <laughs> Outside of this or in general? <laughs> <laughs> final thoughts on Pantera. Dan. Yeah, I mean, it, like, their stamp on the metal scene is undeniable. Um, I have to admit, I'm not, like, the biggest fan of the Southern sound, but I can very much appreciate the impact that it had on the metal scene. And there's still songs that hit me that hit me in the feels. And uh, one of the funny things that, that Jeff said on the original Pantera episode was that when you're listening to Dimebag play, you feel invincible. So I put that to the test. I... Uh, Loaded up on my computer, my vintage Windows 95 computer, and uh, I played the original Doom game from 1993, and I listened to Pantera pretty much exclusively while I played Doom. And I have to admit, I, I definitely felt invincible while listening to those songs. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I think I think overall, their, their Pantera's impact is undeniable. And even if it's not for everybody, you can't ignore the impact that they had on the modern metal scene. Josh, what about you? Oh, good Lord. Uh, any listener to my show knows that Pantera is my all-time favorite band. Uh, like I've said on this episode, you know, they kind of kept metal alive throughout the 90s. You know, the only band that was selling out you know, amphitheaters and, and arenas at the time that was this heavy was Pantera. You know, the, the Metallica at the time kind of went by the wayside heaviness wise. I mean, they were still a popular band and they were playing big shows, but I mean, they put out load, reload and and all, all that nonsense throughout the 90s. And then you've got, uh, you know, the you know, they survived grunge and new metal and, and kind of just stayed true to themselves. And I think that's what made them one of my favorite bands. And then obviously just growing up watching the home videos just kind of took you into that camp. Um you know, I got to meet Pantera uh, multiple times, and every time you went away from Dimebag Daryl, you felt like you were, you know, saying goodbye to a good friend, even though he, you know, you might have only met him for a minute or two, but he just had that about him, man, that could bring you in and make you feel, you know, that he was like your best friend for your whole life, and uh, was such a such a great dude, and it's such a great band, and just all in all, man, it's just uh, you know, great tunes, great band, great chemistry, great charisma. Uh, you know, I can't say enough about Pantera. I think Pantera is the most influential metal band that nobody can fucking touch. Nobody that listens to Pantera can sing, scream, yell, or engage the crowd the way Phil does. You don't think I scream as good as Phil does? Nobody. I take it back. Can play the guitar the same way that Dimebag does and leave the audience wanting more i think even the most diehard eddie van halen fan hears something that they're tired of hearing that doesn't happen when you're listening to Dimebag. every time there's a solo where rex is the only stringed instrument that you can hear it sounds like they wrote a rhythm track but then they cut the rhythm guitars out and let him just own the chug and he does it every single time Vinny attacks the fucking drum set like an old school metal drummer but he does it his own way and brings the groove into the fucking music when you put the Daryl brothers together on everything because they were always on everything together it doesn't sound like two people that are just writing songs it sounds like two people that are on the same wavelength and the perfect oh, yeah. storm of Pantera is fucking brutal as hell and everybody needs to listen to Pantera Dan what's your album of the week Oh, that's kind of a hard one to uh, to quantify, but uh, to to throw back to our our uh, NF episode that we did, I'm I'm still pretty much rocking uh, Perception by NF, in addition to some Pantera songs. Josh, what about you? Uh, album of the week this week will be um, uh, the latest from Sepultura Quadra. 
Uh, if you're a Sepultura fan from any era, you will enjoy Sepultura's Quadra. Uh, kind of, you know, it goes back to their thrash roots in the beginning, all the way through uh, through Roots, through Chaos ED, and even has some of the later stuff. And uh, the, of the Derek Green era album is probably my favorite. Everybody talks about Hell Yeah. They talk about Damage Plan. Nobody talks about Rebel Meets Rebel, where the rhythm section of Pantera just makes awesome music with David Allen Coe. So my album of the week is Rebel Meets Rebel. Take us out, DFT. Have you ever been listening to this podcast and thought to yourself, man, you know, they keep talking about this band and that band. They talked about Pantera twice. I mean, I want them to talk about this band that I really like. You, you can do that. There's a variety of ways you can tell us what bands you want us to talk about on the show. You can send us an email at show at gmail.com. You can send us a Facebook message on facebook.com slash discography discussion. You can send us a tweet at Discuss Metal or at Discuss Metal Dan or Discuss Metal Joe if you have a, uh, a message for one of us in particular. You can check us out on our Discord server. There will be a link in the show notes that will take you to the wonderful world of Discord where people are chatting about discography discussion 24-7. Really great community over there on Discord. You can always join the Discography Discussion official Facebook group at facebook.com slash discography discussion. Just click on the group and I will probably approve you unless you're somebody weird, in which case Jeff will probably approve you. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of ways you can let us know. Uh, We even actually have a fillable form now. If you go to Discography Discussion Facebook page, you can click on the fillable form and you can submit what bands you want to talk about. And on that note, this has been episode 159 of Discography Discussion. Thank you for listening. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Subscribe to our podcast everywhere you listen to podcasts, including Google Play, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher. Visit DiscussMetal.com for all things discography discussion. And please, send questions and comments to Dan and Joe Show at gmail.com. If you are not a patron, you can become one at patreon.com forward slash discuss metal. We have some sweet perks. Josh Toomey and the Talk To Me podcast can be found at Talk To Me Pod on Twitter, Facebook, and everywhere you listen to podcasts. Uh, Hey, Joe, can I have some money? One dollar on Patreon will get you into that exclusive album review feed. Rock on. Well, I mean, I really appreciate you. Guys, it's been great. I'll see you later. (laughs) I really. I really appreciate you doing this episode with us. It's just like we've been talking about it for a long time, and it didn't feel right to do it without you. <laughs> you know? Got to have the right? Toomey on this. Yeah, absolutely. I've been bitching lately. Like, dude, when are we going to have Toomey on a show? Like, I miss talking to Toomey. And I'm like, whenever I point by point take back all that shit that I said. <laughs> <laughs>